So go through your sequence and go ahead then if you would and um, log into your machine. Then uh, once you're there, log into VMware. Once you got VMware, use Google. Come over to Canvas, log into Canvas. And then in the announcements, you'll find the uh, link for today's screencast. I'm not going to complain. It could be worse. We're awfully lucky people. We don't know how lucky we are, but we are. We could we could be over there in the Ukraine, western part of Ukraine, cramming on Russian, Russian language. Mary I figured that out. We could be out in. Oh, could be in Afghanistan. Have folks. Lord of mercy. I'm gonna have to meet this is a chatty crowd. They're all muted now. We're very lucky. Small percentage of people on planet Earth get to do what we get to do. All you get to do with people your age. Very small percentage. Or you're not out in a refugee camp or on a boat in the middle of the Mediterranean trying to get to Italy so you can get out of Libya or some other bad place you want to get away from. We are fortunate, aren't we? We're going to do a mortgage amortization today. This is a uh, case study over on page 388 to 393. And we're going to use the file. It says EO2H1 loans partial key because I did a little bit of the work there for us, okay? And we'll do some looking at it. So, again, the file that we'll use is this one. So you'll wanna download that to your desktop and then I'd rename it and then I'd open it up and I would save it to the desktop to make absolutely certain that you've converted it from a temporary file over here in Canvas to a quote unquote permanent file that dwells within your desktop. All righty, so far so good. Eat lunch before you come here, you get a chance. Okay, any Chick-fil-A people? Chick-fil-A, okay, a few Chick-fil-A, all right. Uh, Lunchables, anybody have a Lunchable? No Lunchables? Okay. Outgrown them, haven't you? Well, that's sad. Anyway, <laughs> we're gonna look at this loan amortization today, and it's over on page 388 to 393. And this is performing quantitative analysis. We're going to do some quantitative analysis. Excel is designed to do that. That's its main function, although it can do some other things. It can kind of, sometimes it can act like a database. And sometimes it can act like a charting tool, but it tries to be everything to everybody. That's why Microsoft designed it, but it is the mother of all spreadsheets. And as I've said before, once you get used to working with it, you understand how it operates and how to use it. More, most importantly, kind of how to re reverse engineer things, you will be far more comfortable as you're having to develop a spreadsheet or a template as we're looking at. So you should have downloaded this file right here to your desktop, okay? So you gotta go through the sequence, just to kind of remind us you log into the machine, log into your computer, then log in to uh, VMware, that's our cloud application. Once you've done that, then you can go to Google, come over to Canvas, log into Canvas. And once you've logged into Canvas, then go into the announcements, 
and you'll find the link for today's screencast and you can call the screencast up on your machine. Got it? You're doing more logging than a lumberjack, aren't you? This is a test designed to test. This is to test our patience. But as I said before, we could be far worse off. We are so lucky. And we're going to look today. This case involves a house and, and a series of loans for a mortgage company, excuse me. And you know, one of the things about this is we're, we're going to learn a little bit about functions, how those work, and we're going to get a sense of how we calculate a house price. Now, I'm going to open the file up. I've got it here on my friendly desktop. Now, by the way, in case anybody wonder who that is, that's Cardinal Buddy. It's from our vacation. We went to Jackson Hole, wife and I and her mother. That's the Grand Tetons. You ever get a chance to go up there, go up there, you drive out of town, boom, there's the mountains. A lot of, a lot of films were made here, cowboy, particularly Westerns. And uh, one of the best ones is the movie Shane. Everybody walk, anybody ever seen that, heard that movie, Shane? Oh my goodness. You need to get some Americana in you. It's a great old movie. It's a good one. It's about a man who was a gunfighter in one of these, drawn back into that confrontation in that battle between good and evil, and once he realizes that the secret's out, he's a gunfighter, he's got to head on out the road. Pretty good story. Anyway, he's, Cardinal Buddy's not smiling because he's about to lose the National, National League Central Division title to the Brewers. Are there any baseball fans here at all? I want to see a few Americans, okay, good. Museum. All right, my friends, let's take a look at, at this file. And as I mentioned before, it is a mortgage amortization file. It's going to show us how it's, going to, it's a mortgage summary file. Excuse me. It's going to, we have that we're, we're dealing with this mortgage company, Towson Mortgage. And if you look over there on page 388, you're going to see a little bit of a vignette about the person involved. They try to make this, you know, personal. And it's this person who works for a real estate agent, and they have to develop this pro forma. Now, I use that word. Do I have any finance majors in here? Okay. You, and you especially are going to get to work with pro formas. And a pro forma, it's, I'll call my little text thing up here. Here it is. It's a Latin word. It's a fancy word for a form or for the sake of. In finance, accounting people develop what they call, what they call develop workbooks and, and output that meet what they call generally accepted accounting standards or practices, the gap. Finance people work more and use those, that, those data as tools. So they develop a pro forma. A pro forma is like a template or template. I call it template. That's because I like to say words like that. Like the x rocks machine. Okay. With me? Now, when it's a performa or a template, what it means is it's designed to plug any one of a number of types of financial products or purchases into it and analyze them accordingly. Here we're looking at a mortgage or a set of mortgages for a mortgage company. Now, I'm going to get my handy eraser out here and get rid of that. Okay. Let's look at what we're looking at. What do you think? Now, we've got a title on this thing, correct? This is Townsend Mortgage Company. Notice down at the bottom, we have a couple of tabs. A workbook in Excel is gonna be made up of at least one worksheet or more. And in this worksheet, they, in the, in, the, in the tabs down here, notice that they have them named for us. So we have the identifiers, so we know how the workbook's organized. And what we could do if we wanted would be to change the 
we could put some fill in each one of those to really differentiate each tab if we chose to do that. And that's pretty simple. Uh, on the details, cl right click, okay? And let's put tab color and let's, let's da -da, put the dark green. Now we're good. And then on the payment info, let's do the tab color and let's go golden, green to gold, right? How many of you know that we used to have a live bison here as our mascot? You don't know that? Oh my goodness. We used to have a real live bison. His pen, he had a kind of a little, um, a little house and then a, a pen where he could walk. His name was Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was a real live bison and he was out in the parking lot of what's now the um, not the Geiger Center, but the uh, Noble Complex is in that, what was down in the parking lot. And he had room to roam around. He'd go out in the morning. He'd say, what's happening? He'd go. <sighs> and he had people who took care of him. They were called the Chips. And I believe until he re comes back, we're cursed. Just like the Cubs had the curse of the goat. Now, wouldn't you rather have a live bison at the basketball game? Here's what they did. They'd have all this dry ice, and then here he'd come out on the court. Now, obviously, they had to, do, they had to make some adjustments in terms of his feeding schedule because he was out in public, and it was excitable. But that was so cool to see him go around the basketball court. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm prying a little bit in your business, but I'd say this. I think everyone would be all right. The president would say, I want Bill Shazer back. There's plenty of room on the hill over there. Wouldn't it be cool to see him come out? Huh? No, not, 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 not at all. Some of you might end up being part of the chips again. Those are the guys, gentlemen, who took care of Bill Shazer until the administration decided we didn't need Bill Shazer. I thought I'd throw that in. It's completely irrelevant, but I do it every time I get a group of freshmen. Okay, let's take a look at this. At the top, we have uh, Townsend Mortgage. Let's go over here to column G. Let's go to cell G1, and let's put your name. I will put author, and then in H1, I'm going to put my name so they know who designed this. Uh, What's another thing I'm gonna put in here to warn people or to tell people there's nothing to be worried about? Macros, exactly, you're right, thank you. And we're gonna put none, okay? So we have no macros and we have today's date, which is 9-26-19 and we use the today function. Now again, the display is there in cell B3, B, yeah, B4, excuse me. And if you look up the formula bar, you'll see the input, input, output, okay? So if you're to say, well, how did they do that? Just look up in the formula bar, you with me? And so it gives us a date and a time stamp. So far so good? So we've got those elements put together. Now let's come down here and, and look at this very first array over here at A3 through A, A3 through B7. Take a look at the array there. Now that's called a what? What's the title there? It's an input area, exactly. That's where we put some things in, like constants that we're gonna use maybe in an equation data that are pretty fixed or data that are gonna stay the same unless we change them for a particular reason. But they're typically data that don't change. Now, we change the date because we use the, the today function, but if you take a look, we're gonna see the number of payments per year, and on most mortgages, the payments are 12, which corresponds to what? The 12 disciples? 
12 months in a year, exactly. Monthly payments. But I was just trying to integrate some faith and chlorine. What do you think? Okay. Actually, there were 13, but one, of course, bit the dust. And then they elected another. Actually, what they did is they rolled die and said, God will choose the new disciple. That's how folks did things. You read your Bible. You read your Bible? I hope you do. I'll expect you to be in church Sunday morning. I'll be there. Misery loves company. That was a joke. I'm not, I'm making a joke. I've taught Sunday school a long time. You say, that must be a church full of heathen. And it is. So we've got over here in the input area, we've got 12 payments per year because that coincides with the month. We have a thing called the PMI rate. The PMI rate is an additional charge to loans that look like they could or might go bad. Now, the textbook's going to speak about this, but we'll talk about this for just a moment. This is a premium that a borrower pays if they don't put down a certain amount of money on a property. Typically on a house, it's 20%. If you don't put down 20% 20, 20 or more, you have to pay a private mortgage insurance. That helps ensure the people who lend you the money that if you go south or you don't make your payments, then they're covered. Okay? Now, then you have a down payment rate, and that's the, that's the, the criteria, okay? 20%. So far, so good? That's what we're after, basically 20%. Let's look over here in this next array, and that's going to be uh, B3 down to E7, E6, excuse me, and that what do we have here? We have the number of years on these loans and we have the rate. Is there a pattern or anything you notice about that in terms of the interest rate charged? Is there a pattern? You're gonna have to learn about patterns. <clears throat> Well, you see there, what's happening as we go down further and further and further in terms of the number of years? The rate goes up. Why do you suppose that's, why do you suppose the rate goes up? Well, you'll learn about it if you haven't already. It's a thing called risk and reward. The higher the risk I take in an investment, the more reward I should expect. So if I loan somebody money for 30 years, basically, I'm gonna charge a higher interest rate simply because a lot of stuff can happen in 30 years, right? Now, in truth, the typical, the typical American who buys a home will buy five or six, maybe seven homes in their lifetime as they go from one job to the other and you'll never probably stay in one place and pay it off, okay? But if you take out a 30-year note, you're gonna pay a higher interest rate. You're just going to. I'm very interested in finance. In fact, I went and got a master's in it. Anybody here ever heard of Popeye, the sailor? Okay, let me tell you what happened. I had a revelation. I was but a wee lad. I was watching Popeye the sailor Okay, and what's the food that makes him really strong and stuff? Spinach, good for you, huh? Uh, okay. Well, I was watching Popeye, you remember his friend Wimpy? And Wimpy said, may I borrow a quarter from you so I can buy a hamburger? I will gladly pay you next week. And the light bulb went on. And I said, you know, let's think about this. Popeye gives him the quarter, right? He eats the hamburger. The hamburger's gone, and so's the quarter, right? Now what could happen between next Tuesday and when he borrows the quarter from Popeye? The Lord could come, 
and all bets are off. Popeye might get hit by a truck or die, or what was his wife's name? Olive oil. She might club him to death. Who knows? And domestic, terrible thing. Wimpy, he might walk in front of a truck or die of a heart attack. So there's no guarantee. So I thought, well, huh. So I charge interest on money to cover the risk that I take. You got it? So there's a quick lesson there for us. The higher the risk that the lender absorbs in terms of the amount of time, the higher the interest rate. And you'll see that interest rates 3.25%, 3.65, and 3.7. Okay? You with me so far? Now, let's walk through this. Come down here to row nine. We're going to walk across and look at the data we've got. We have some, first, we have the loan number. That's to identify the loan. Okay? Then we've got the cost of the house. We've got a down payment. Okay? And we have the amount financed. Now let's look at that formula. And as you would guess, the amount we finance, the amount we borrow is what? The house costs less the down payment. So far so good? Pretty simple, not any big deal. Now we look at the percent down, we'll go over to this next one. And let's look at the percent down and we find out that it's 20%. How do I know? I click the formula and I divide the down payment by the house. Now we could use the name manager in here and we've gone through that and we're just to save a little bit of time today, we're not going to, but it would, if I wanted to go ahead and use the name man manager and identify down payment, house cost, amount finance, et cetera, I could do that. And if I were going to be using this over and over and over as this person will in this little vignette, we've got, I do that. So far so good? Now, then we see the number of years, okay? Now, if I make 12 payments a year and I'm gonna finance the house for 25 years, how many payments am I gonna make? None, I'm gonna live in it for a month and party and then leave. No, how many you gonna, how many, how many will I make? 25 years, 12 payments a year, 300 payments. When you buy your first house, you come to the very end and when you close on your house, your very first house, and you look at how much you're gonna pay for the home you bought, you're gonna be in a state of shock because 30 years of interest adds up to a lot. So it's to your advantage, if at all possible, to put down as much money as you can when you buy your first house. And when you buy your first house, if you haven't bought one already, start slow. Don't buy something that you can't afford. And people will try to get you to do that. Okay? I've, I've known people who, who bought a house. I had some friends who bought a house <laughs> and they were what we call house poor. They bought a beautiful house, but they couldn't buy any furniture. They couldn't even buy curtains. So they hung towels and sheets up over the walls. That's not good. You, that means you're probably too leveraged. Let's look across here and how we have an APR. What's an APR? What does APR stand for? What do you think? APR. I know many of you know what APB means. You've probably been the subject of one. All points bulletin. APR. What do you think it means? And uh, you're close, it's annual percentage rate. There's how much interest do we charge these folks on an, on an annual basis, okay? With me so far? So it's the APR is the annual percentage rate. So for this loan, it's 25 years, they put down 20.2%, they're, they're gonna have an annual percentage rate of 3.65%. Now we come to the monthly payment. Click in cell H9, and let's take a look at that. 
Here we're using a function. It's called the payment function. You see the little FX up there? Insert function, click on it, and it's going to give us the dialog box. And we're going to walk through. And the nice thing about this tool is that every step of the way it's going to tell us what I need to input. And then all I have to do is just grab the cell to plug it in. Or, and so let's look. First of all, we have the rate. And that's the interest rate per period for the loan. And then we have the number of payments. And then we have the present value. The present value means what that house is worth. What do I owe today? And then I have the future value and I want that future value to be zero. In other words, I pay it off. Okay. And then there's a thing called type. This is a little bit more in financial, financial jargon, but type just simply means I make a payment at the end of the month as opposed to the first of the month. Now, if you can arrange it to pay at the first of the month, you'll save yourself a lot of money. But lenders often will not let you do that unless you put down an extraordinary amount of money. There's a reason why. They make money off of interest. That's why they loan money. But they provide you a home. And the home that's built provides jobs for the people who built it or came in and rehabbed it. Does that make sense? So far, this is pretty simple to see. And then I, I plug the data in, I click OK, and there's my, there's my answer. Now, once you notice something in the book, the authors have you go ahead and take that payment amount and multiply it times negative one so it looks positive. I don't like that. <laughs> that red means outflow. I'm paying. Follow me? Now, the convention is typically people will want that. You'll take that negative. You take this whole thing times, times negative once you make it a positive number. Or you could make it an absolute number if you want to and use that function. But the bottom line is you're paying out. Once you've got the cell referencing set up, it's simple. You can just come right down and do the drag and drop. Now, I want to ask you something. Take a look in that. Look, take a look there in the formula bar. And I'm looking at equals payment. That's the function in Excel, MT. And it lets me figure out the payment on anything I buy on time. It could be a car, it could be a house, it could be a credit, a line of credit at the bank, it could be a credit card. That's why we call it a performa because I can use this tool in a lot of different ways. But let's look at this. Now, I've got dollar sign K9. What does that mean? What does that dollar sign in front of the K tell me? I'm talking about the cell referencing now. Okay, I'm going to stay in the columns exactly. And then if you look there, you're going to see M9, and that means I'm going to stay in column 9 in the rows will change, right? And then D9, the dollar sign's in front of the D, so I'm going to be, I'll be staying in column D, but the rows will change. And then we have that zero, that's the, the future value, that is we assume we'll pay the loan off. And then we have a one which says, I'm going to pay, make my payments at the end of the month. The dialog box is a really good tool for you. So as you go through your courses, like if you took your first finance course, introduction to finance, this is a great way to really kind of capture and understand what's going on. You'll probably get to do the formulas and all that stuff, which will be great fun for you. But when you use Excel, it will also show you the dialog box and it will make it go real much more faster or it will reinforce it for you. Make sense? And then we drag and drop this. Now, I've got some figures over here and look there at, at um, K9, okay? And you say, where did, where did I get that? Let's look up at the formula bar and click on it. And what that does is I now am saying, okay, here's, much, here's how much interest I pay per month. I'll make this a real easy one. If I pay 12% interest a year, my APR is 12%, how much do I pay a month? Well, 
Why do you think? I pay 12% annually. Then how much do I pay per year if I make 12 payments a year? Take a shot. 1%. You're right. Exactly. It's that simple. You just take the APR, the annual percentage rate, and you divide it by 12, and that tells you how much you pay per month. And I have that there for you over in this array. Now, I understand this is not exciting, but it will be when you buy your first house and your heart's pounded and you're signing all this stuff and you've gone to the bank and you've gotten a cashier's check for a lot of money and you're getting ready to move in. You've been through credit reports, the whole business. That's the time to keep your head and understand what's going on. So that's why I'm going to urge you again, take Dr. Reader's personal finance class. Do yourself a favor. Anybody here bought their first car? On time, okay. Anybody bought a house on time yet? No? Anybody paid cash for a house? If you have, I wanna be, I want you to adopt me today. Okay. Let's look at this next column over here. I have the number of payments, and I just simply took the number of years times 12. You say, Dr. Harmon, could, is it possible that I could make more than 12 payments a year? Yes. There's some people out there, folks out there, who will push mortgages that are where you pay 15 years, so you save all this money. Your payment will be higher, but you save a little bit of money. There will be people who say, well, you should make your mortgage payment twice a month so you pay it off faster. The faster you pay off your mortgage, the less interest you pay. One of the things you're going to find in, in a lot of these, like, for example, finance, think about the word interest. If I gave you 50 bucks and you, and you never came back again, well, I might, I'm, I'm not going to be interested in tracking you down and finding you to get the 50 bucks. But if I give you $100,000, I will find you. That's why they call it interest. Okay? So far we've, and, and let's notice some of the design elements have gone again. We had the, we had the uh, here in, in row one, we have the Townsend Mortgage Company. We have the title, we have the author, we have, we identify it, we let the, the end user or the reader know there are no macros. Then I have these input areas up here, okay? And then I come down to what I would call the work area where I use those inputs. And so I come up with the APR and the monthly payment and PMI. Why is there nothing showing up in the PMI for loan 397, 39, 397, 392, 786. Why, why aren't they paying a private mortgage insurance fee? Go ahead, yes. Right, they put, more, they put enough money down to avoid having to pay that. If you don't, it, look at those two loans there that have a PMI. What that means is they pay the monthly payment plus the PMI. You see, so I'm paying insurance against me taking off and not making on good on the loan. Yeah. Because you didn't put enough money down. Food for thought. How many of you plan to buy a house? I see hands going up. Okay, let's talk a little bit here. Not just about spreadsheeting, but for a minute, let's talk about some real life stuff. Let's look at this one monthly payment here. These folks at the very, their very first loan, they put down, they put down um, 86,000 bucks on a house that costs $425,000. Now, $425,000 here in Oklahoma City will buy you a lot. $425,000 in New York City will get you uh, one bedroom and a bathroom. 
and you hope it's a tub or a big shower, that's where you sleep. Because a real estate's different. Prices are different. But if you look at that payment amount, what someone is going to tell you, if they're honest with you, a real estate agent, a mortgage broker, or a financial advisor, that $1,700 should be no more than about 30% of what you gross. So you'll need to be grossing about five grand a year to handle that kind of payment. I'm just passing you some information along. So hopefully you'll register in your memory banks and you'll go, oh, I remember that, okay. Because folks will, especially if the interest rates are low like they're right now, they will try to get you to overcommit. Okay, well, so far so good. We, we worked through and we did the monthly payment, but what is this monster that I've got staring at me here in this formula bar? And let's look at it for a moment. It's called a conditional statement. Okay. Who with me? <clears throat> Just like you exercise your bodies, it's good to exercise your mind and conditional statements will do that for you. Let's look at this for just a moment. It says equal if B7 is greater than E9. Here's how a conditional statement works. It says if there is some condition or something I'm looking for, then here's the response. If not, I move on to the next possible test. It's a logical test. How many of you have ever seen a conditional statement before? It's a lot like uh, when you went to the store and you saw the candy at the aisle in Walmart and your mama said, if you ask for candy one more time, I'm gonna take you to the restroom and we're gonna have a talk. That was how my mother handled things. So I, I see people at, you know, be in the middle of Walmart and they'll tell their kid, you ask for candy once more, I'm gonna kill you. And I go, hmm. My parents probably thought that many times about me. I'm glad they kept it to themselves because it was probably too much information. Anyway, we've got this conditional statement that says if, and what's, can somebody tell me what's over there in B7? What's in, what's in B7? What's the figure there in B7? Okay, so it says if the down payment is greater than, what's E9? It's what? Okay, if it's greater than, if, if B7 is greater than E9, in other words, if that rate, the down payment rate is larger than what I have that I put down, then I pay PMI. And the rest of that says how they compute the PMI by taking B6 times D9. This is why we'd use a name manager and we divide that B by B5, and then we put a comma, and then zero is like a default value. Now what you would want to do would be this. And when I encounter something like this, here is, here's a habit I've made over the years, and this won't be the first one of these you'll see, it won't be the last. And so yes it is. I'm gonna put my sticky note here, I'm gonna create a new one, okay? that. Oh, I need oh. I'll just put it right here. Let's look at Mr. Sticky Note. I haven't mastered the sticky note yet. I'm still used to, here we go. Okay, now what I will do, and this is what you would be wise to make a practice of, would be to identify each of those cells. Write them out in English. Write them out. Tell me what they are, okay? So B7 is gonna be what? The down payment rate. And then in that case, E9 is what? The amount they actually put down. And so if the, if the down payment rate, the 20%, 
is greater than what you put down, then you pay the PMI. So this part over here, starting from this comma on, is the private mortgage insurance. That's how they compute it. Otherwise, if you've met the criteria where you put down 20% or more, it's a default, you get a zero, and it puts that blank in over there. And I just make a habit of doing that. So I understand what's there and what I've done. I'll often, I'll often just simply write out the formula before I use a conditional statement just to make sure I'm on track. Okay? Yes? Your life is gonna be a whole series of conditional statements. It already has been. If you do this, there'll be some type of consequence or result. Same story in the spreadsheet, okay? Now I wanna ask you a question. Has this been the most exciting 35 or 40 minutes you've ever spent in your life? Okay, you're nodding your heads in approval. That's good, you're learning. Always agree with the boss. And make eye contact with the instructor. Slide. And you'll learn it. You'll, you, by the time you're a senior, you'll learn how to look like you're terribly involved, but you'll be going. You'll be sleeping or listening to something or who knows what. You'll master that skill. But for now, let's think about what we've got here. Again, we've got if B7, that's the down payment rate, is greater than E9, and E9 is where I put it, is where I put, is where I record how much I put down, then I pay private mortgage insurance. And how do you compute it? It's right here. And if I don't, then it's zero, which is the default, meaning I don't have to pay any, and it shows up as that blank. That's all that's going on. Now, I clicked on the formula bar, and something happened to all those numbers and letters that were in there. What happened? You notice anything in the formula bar when I clicked in there? Anything happened? It, it lit up like a Christmas tree, right? Why? Talk to me. Indicate what? Exactly. Indicate which cells are being used. So I can make some sense of what I'm looking at. It gives me some feedback. It gives me a breadcrumb. It gives me a trail to follow. So far, so good. Now, if you look in that, if you look at that, if you look at the formula bar, you're going to see the cell referencing. And if you do the cell referencing correctly, as they do there, you just simply drag and drop, and away you go. And it calculates all of them for you. That makes sense? You say it cannot be this easy. It truly is. It never ceases to amaze me that you guys are so bright and you let some little numbers on a page scare you. Or you let some stuff like programming scare you. Inside, some of you is an accountant dying to get out. They're in there saying, let me out. You'll we'll never make it in Nashville. You're fooling yourself. There's some of you that are here, inside of you, there's a computer science scientist waiting to get out. Do I have any marketing majors here? One, two, three, okay. You see this gentleman at the back? If you're smart, you'll take some courses from him because when you go out to apply for a job in a marketing firm, they're gonna to wanna to know what you know about digital advertising and design. So if you're smart, you'll take a course with him or two if you want to be an employable market graduate. 
I get $50 referral for every one of you who do so, please. Okay. Okay. So far, we've had some big fun with this. Now, we've got the payment, we've got the uh, details on these payments and the interest and all that business and how much we pay and the monthly, the PMI. Let's click on the payment info. Okay. Pardon me, click on the details start. We've been in payment. Wow, look at that. Did you see that, that gold pop up there on payment info? That's green and gold. You're not enthused? You're all wearing, a lot of you have green t-shirts on. I go green and gold, and you go, mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope you're not like that on Saturdays. I guess you know, we score a touchdown, and you go, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you're going crazy. Now, over in this, we have the input, another input area here, and let's put in today's date, and we can use this date here, and we use the now function because there's more than one way to indicate a date and time stamp. So click on cell B4 and put equal now. And there it is. Got it? Now, we're gonna do a little bit of work here with some cell referencing. So let's come down here to this array, which is A7, all the way over to K12, okay? Yes? And we're gonna start with the amount finance. Okay. And I'm gonna give us a little formula here, and this will equal B8 minus C8. Now, I can put the dollar signs in and go ahead and scroll right on down and it'll be just fine. If I was going to be doing this over and over, I'm going to use the name manager. So let's talk about that for just a second. So I'll just go to do the drag and drop and we'll put, now I want to make sure I stay in column B, so what do I do? Do I put a dollar sign in front of the B or the six if I want to stay in the column? Huh? B, yep. And then I want to stay in column C, so I'll put a dollar sign in front of that. Boom. And I'm financing $320,000. That's a lot of money. Ooh, mercy. Okay, now you say, all right, if I've done that, can I just simply drag and drop it down? Yes. So put your little cursor there, you see the little square thing? Now, I, I have called Microsoft repeatedly and they're ignoring me. I've said what we'd like at OU for the little drag and drop thing is not that little plus thing. I want like a cross, but they're ignoring me. Follow restraining order last week. I don't understand that at all. All right, and there we are. I could have used the name manager of well and just and done that, it would have made more sense to me. So let's go up here and click on formula. Click on, and let's click over here on cell B8. And we're gonna define a name. You see the define names area? All right. And that's the house cost. And I'm, gonna, and I'm going to click here and say just for payment info tab. And then I click OK. And now if I want to use it in a formula, I can use the house cost. So I should have it up here in the day manager. There it is. And I want to use a for, use a name and a formula. I should have the house cost here. And I don't know why in the world that's not things not showing up. We did do it. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So I need to go to I need to go just to this other. Yeah, got you covered. Well, 
we could turn it back to the workbook, but. Okay. Now I'm gonna go ahead and adjust that. I'm gonna click on the name editor and now click on, click on the name manager and click at it. Okay, and on house costs, instead of just the payment information, I'm gonna to try to edit that. In fact, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna delete it and just start over. So click on the house cost and delete it. It's gone, we didn't break anything, it's all right. Okay, and now I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna click over here in B8. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the whole array. I'm gonna go from B8 down to B12, okay? You with me there? So I'll highlight B8 to B12, and then I'm gonna click Define Name, and I'm gonna keep it in the workbook, make it easier to work with, and click OK. Now when I'm ready to use a formula, I can. I have the house cost. Then I could do the same thing for down payment. I could, and then I could do the same thing for the amount. Well, the amount financed is gonna be a calculated field. So I might wanna leave it alone. Mortgage rate, same story. Now we're gonna hit the rate per period, okay? And if you take a look there at page 389 in your textbook, you have your book with you? You got it open, you follow along? I hope. You're gonna see that we, we have that, that rate of 3.625% divided by 12. So it's a simple thing. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna divide it by, I'll put equal, and I'm gonna divide it now we get I skip here for a minute, so I don't mess it up. But equal. And then I'll click on F8. Pardon me, E8. That's the mortgage rate. And I'm going to divide it by 12. And that's the amount, amount per, per period. Now Here's one of these issues where we wanna do a little bit of formatting. So click on F8 after you've done the equation and click home and let's increase the decimal. Can somebody tell me how to increase the decimal? Okay, go home and, and tab and then go over to the number tab and increase it. I took it out, I don't know, two, four, six digits. I wanna do that when I'm starting to, when I start to talk about large amounts of money, I probably wanna take it out about six digits because it does matter. Which was so far? Now, the rest of this is just, it's repetition of just simply, uh, well, we'll just drag it, we'll do the, put in the, re the uh, referencing so I'll put a dollar sign in front of the E and I'm good there. And then I'm just gonna carry it all the way on down and it's already all formatted for me and I have now the rate per, rate per period. Okay, that's me so far? Yes? Anybody not? Has anybody found some shoes you've been looking for on Amazon or something to download? Okay. Questions at this point? When will you shut up? I don't know. I understand. So we've got the rate per period. How many payment periods do I have? Let's start with that first loan. How many payment periods am I gonna have? I'm making how many payments per year? 12. And how many years am I financing it for? 
Okay, 25. Now I'm going to show you how we use a full absolute reference to our advantage. Click on cell B5, then take your cursor and highlight it and press F4. It's supposed to give me, supposed to turn, you little weasel, you're supposed to turn into, oh, oh, oh okay. I'm sorry, it's, it's just a figure, okay. Let's see here. Ah, I know what I'm gonna do. Come back over here to H8 and put equal. Ah, there we go. B5, there I got the, the uh, reference, not just the figure. And then press on F4. And that'll be times. And we're going to put G8, and we're going to dollar sign in front of the G. Now, what I've just done is I've said, okay, I've converted that cell there in B5 to an absolute reference. It's got dollar signs in front of each. I pinned a tail on a donkey, I put a, a donkey, I put a pin in the map. Then I multiply it times the, the uh, number of years and I make sure that I stay in the column G, right? I'm ready to go, correct? And now we can just simply scroll down. Voila. Yes. Now, why have I come to guide you through this and make it an easy experience where you could sleep, you could shop, whatever? The terror is yet to come. When we get near the end of the course, I ask you to do this in some projects, these types of things. Then we'll find out if you were paying attention. It's called learning and then applying what you learn. But I want you to understand what we're doing. Every time we get a chance in this spreadsheet, we're using cell referencing as a tool to make, to, to stop us from having to do a whole bunch of computation. We can just do the drag and drop. Just like when I showed you with the name manager, we can just define something in its name and then we can look at the variables or the items and see something other than just a number and a, co a column number and a row number. So far, it's good? Yes? Now, let's scroll down here and it says some summary statistics. Let's look at that. We've got some st statistics for the house costs, the down payment, and the amount financed. And we have here these, these sets uh, there from row 16 through 20. We have what we call summary data. And there's a function for each of these. Let's do the house cost, okay? And so we're gonna do the, the total for that. If I wanna do the total for that, how, what function do you think I might use? Okay, let's give it equal sum. And then put a parenthesis. And now we'll go up here and we'll grab those. And there it is. That's how much. Those are the. That's the total amount spent on the houses. Isn't that nice? We had the house cost there. It said the sum, so we'd use the name manager. Now you can see why I would want to use it. Now we want the average. So what function do you think we're going to use in Excel to get the average? Brilliant. We call it what we want. We call it what it is. It's average. Never let little numbers on page scare you. So I'm going to click on the average function. It pops up. And then I'm going to come over here back to the cells for house costs and come right on down. Now we can paste the formulas and we're going to do that later on. And then we come to the median. The median is the middle price. Just like you have a median in a street, same thing, median is the middle value. It tells us more about how stuff is clustered together than how it does in terms of, of, of their spread apart. When people say the average income in the United States is X amount of dollars, that's fine. 
if a politician or someone like that's going to tell you that income, income here is great, they'll give you the average because the average is very sensitive. If someone's honestly speaking to you about income levels in the United States, they'll give you the median because the median gives you the middle. The median, if it's, it's, it's a far cry to take somebody making $90,000 a year and average them in with somebody making a billion dollars a year versus the middle income, the median. When you get stat or you work with enough stat, you'll get that. So we're going to use the median, which is, okay, click on the median. And then I just grab those cells. Now at this point, you're, you're understanding this, you're going, oh, okay, wonderful. If I'm after the lowest house costs, what am I going to use? There's a function for it. Okay, I'm going to use the, equal, the minimum, equal. And I'll just grab those cells. Boom. And I've got the minimum. How about the highest? Is there a function for it? Okay, I'm going to use the max, equal max. All right. And here we go. And then finally, the number of mortgages. And that's a little tricky. If I want to know the number of mortgages, is there a function that will help me figure out how many there are? And which is what? Count. Chocula or Dracula? How many of you know what to count Chocula? Have you had count Chocula for breakfast? Good stuff, right? That and a diet soda and you're good to go. You're wired, you're ready. Count Dracula, everybody knows you count Dracula's, right? John Girl, I guess maybe the ones that grew up before you watched all those vampire movies, people biting each other on the neck. Oh, mercy. It gives me the heebie jeebies. All right. So we're going to use the count function. So equal C O U N T. Now, if you have, if you have hillbilly Excel, it's K O U N T. I are one, so I can talk about it. When that bluegrass music comes in, my DNA kicks in. That's where my people come from. That's who they are, who they was. So I have an affinity for it. I hear bluegrass, and all my DNA goes, yeah, yeah. Where's the still? How many of you know what a still is? I'm going to pray for you if you do. I'm praying for you. You always say are on the path to evil. So now I'm going to grab these cells. Make sure you grab them all. And we'll get the count. And there are five mortgages. You say, well, that's not very impressive. That's true, but if you had 150 of them, which would you rather do, sit there and try to count each row, or would you use, use the function? Okay. Now, really what happens is you just simply, you'll just repeat that same process of the down payment, the down payment, and the amount finance using those same functions. And you can paste those functions in, and we'll talk about that in a, a week or two when we, when we work on pasting functions in, so we can just copy and paste the function, change the re cell references, and boom, away we go. Does that make sense? Now, the average mortgage, the average house cost here is $304,000. So just to have a little bit of fun, let's go looking for a crib. What do you think? So I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna open up a brand new tab on my browser, and I'm gonna go to Zillow. Anybody been to Zillow? I like to go to Zillow and drink. See these gigantic houses and go, that says Keith. But I'll never live in one of them because I don't have that kind of money in my pocket. That's because God allowed my parents, my real parents, to switch me at birth with the people who say they're my mother and father. I'm actually, I think I'm actually a Rockefeller. I believe I am. 
Anybody heard of the Rockefellers? I'll tell you what rich is, not having two million shares of Facebook, rich is I own a third of the timber in the United States. That's rich, my friends. That's rich. Well, let's go to Zillow real quick. And you can go over and take a look now. Let me say this, don't get too caught up as you go through life with material things. If you, ha if you can have them, fine, but use them for a greater good. A house, if you're like me and my wife or a lot of people, you're house freaks. You know, you're remodeling, you're doing this or that. But always remember, what does the Bible tell us about the house? If we're saved, we're gonna go to heaven. If Jesus, did Jesus say anything about houses? It's right there in Matthew. He says, watch house hunters every week. Did you miss that? It's Matthew chapter 95, verses five through nine. What does he say about houses? You say anything about them? Oh my goodness. He said what? In heaven, there are many what? Mansions where you'll dwell with me. You're going to live pretty large when you get to heaven. You believe in heaven? I hope you do. I hope you're a Christian. If you're not, come talk to me sometime. I'm not a stupid person, and I wouldn't be a Christian if I was not absolutely positively sure, and I'd check every bit of information I could possibly do as a human being to find out. Otherwise, I wouldn't be one. It'd be stupid to be one. But... Have you even heard of Pascal's Wager? Now, I know some of you are going to sneak down here to the casino this weekend, and you're going to eat the buffet, then you go and play the slots, and you say, well, I just went there to eat. Pascal's Wager. Pascal is a mathematician. He said, okay, here's the deal. I live in this, in this body and in this life for only a certain amount of time. And if I become a Christian, I follow Christianity, okay, I'm gonna give some things up or my life will be run by who? If you're a Christian, who runs your life? Well, Jesus should. So I give up that control and then I go, and is eternity longer than the amount of time I'm gonna live for sure? But if I don't become a Christian and it was real and I die like the rich man, the parable of the rich man, I look up and I'm, wow, I'm in hell. I'm here for good. It's like having an obnoxious sibling. They're with you forever. Just ask my siblings, they'll tell you. Ones are alive. <laughs> well, go over and Zillow and let's take a look. Ooh, that was sinister, wasn't it? Go over and Zillow and take a look and see what 400,000 will buy you for a house. Now, you know what? I'm almost, I feel so good about that. I'm not going to give an invitation, but I'm going to do the right thing and I'm going to take up an offering. What do you think? No? How many of you know that Justin Bieber is a graduate of OBU? That's a lie. It's not true. It's just simply not true. Well, you'll want to take the file we've been working on, save it, and upload it for your workshop credit. You want to keep it too because you're going to run into some tasks like this when we get down to the end of the course. We've got some projects to do. So I hope you're paying attention, taking some notes, or had your thought, your thought cap on. Now, one of the things you can do is this. If you don't bring paper and pencil with you, here's a good practice. Insert and use a text box and let's find that little text box and make some notes to yourself about what you did in here. So it will remind you. Or if you're in a meeting or you're in a presentation, somebody says, well, how did you get that? You can click to the sales or you can say, hey, here's what I did. Or you could make some notes for yourself and save this. I actively look for that when I go through your files. That's the tool there for you to keep some notes. Well, 
Did we cover any ground or not? What do you think? Okay. How many football players I got in here? What days do you, what days do you put the pads on and black on each other before during the season? You have full contact days? Tuesday through Thursday. That's full contact, full pads. And the first, first offense practices against the first defense. Is that how it works? Not always. Does the quarterback get a little pink shirt to wear so they don't get hit? Don't hit the quarterback. We never hit the quarterback. When I played, he carried a switchblade, so <laughs> I was a mess with him. And he shaved, and I didn't. I scared anybody at that point in my life. Anybody shaved? Whoop, uh -uh, I'm not going to deal with that. Shaved guys up. We'd play somebody, and they all look like they, they are shaving and stuff. I'd go, oh, I'm going to get a beating tonight. Didn't always happen. Well, I understand your fears. You know, in the first two or three minutes, if you're all right, we have any linemen in here? No linemen? Not a, oh, okay. What do you, what's your, what will you play? What on the line? Are you a receiver? Your defensive lineman? Oh, so you, you, you inflict punishment. Oh, very good. It's just sports. Don't worry about it. Well, have you had enough of me yet? You tired of sitting in class with him? Be honest. No, you're you're going to be a lawyer. You can't be. Let's get that. Let's get kill that habit off you. No, I'm teasing. I'm picking on you. That's all. Well, folks, we've come to the time where I'm going to ask you that question: Is why are you in my lab? Have a good weekend. Now, is anybody driving home over the weekend? Remember, if you get tired, don't stop at the rest stop and sleep. You'll have a creepy guy looking in the window, and we'll be looking for you. Just keep pushing on. Come back. Good luck this Saturday. If you guys are playing, are you playing this Saturday? Yep. Good luck. Who are you playing? Oh, okay. Oh, it's going to be here. All right. Very good. Thank you much, folks. All right. Thank you very much for spending the time. Appreciate it. I'm sorry? Uh, let's see. Um, Randy came Tuesday night. He's doing data admin. Okay. Data admin is a, uh, I'm running a, in a hybrid format. What we do in the first, it's, it's six to nine. I do the first 75 to 90 minutes in class. Okay. And then I, then I give them a, uh, then I do a second, a part two that they view online. Okay. That's how I, so how I handle it. So, and the, any given day in here, there are 40 students enrolled, but on any given day, I'm going to have, I had some out here today who were, who were uh, screencasting because they're out, they're traveling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're yeah. Did Peter ever get back with you to see you on your committee? He never said a word. Oh, never did. Huh. Uh, so I. Okay. Did you I find a replacement or did you need somebody else? Uh, Rich said you guys can go ahead and do it. Okay. The two of you. Do you think okay. we need a third? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know I uh, defer to Rich. Gail's about usually here too. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no. Uh, I I don't care. Just kind of. Yeah, who knows? I, Are you sure? Do you work? Do you, yeah, you work with? Do you work with him very? Not very much. Okay. I'm in the same college. But I, I didn't want to say. I sent him. I, well, you saw the email yeah. threads, and I was. I was. But so I never. No, I mean I, I've always he, known him to be pretty responsible. He probably heard of how obnoxious I am and decided not to come in and observe me. Ah, oh, I tried. I but thank you so much. I appreciate. It. I know it's. A, I know it's a time investment. So, I guess when uh, Randy's going to come in to uh, data admin on the on the eighth. Okay. Now, you should be set up as an observer here. Okay. Which yeah. allows you. A lot to, of emails. Okay. Yeah. Which allows you to come in and look and see everything and what's okay. going on, so you can see the whole course, how how I'm dealing with it, etc. 
be kind in terms of how I've got organized because it is an LMS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it's got its its limitations. Yeah. But I'm doing what I can try to do with it. Um, and you're and if you should want to take a look at the other courses, you're fine. Um, this is the only one that's strictly ground based, although I make right. the recordings. Okay. And once I've had a few of them pick up on it, they'll they'll pop in and if they're gonna travel, some of them will, will uh will we'll join live and then others will yeah. we'll see but i get all the analy i get all of their login data and all their analytics so i know pretty much what they're up to yeah, yeah. oh yeah do you canvas. take attendance for the physical classes uh i i take the canvas login okay yeah you see that for yeah I, I just use that for, yeah that's how i do attendance because it okay. there's no um there's no arguing with that although they want to but i can tell them like here's I get a, I get a, every day, every uh, 48 hours, it will refresh who's logged in. Okay. So I just target the days of the class okay. and I know who's logged in. Yeah. Right. So they wouldn't okay. necessarily have to come. They could do this from their dorm. If they, they, if they had to, yes. I'm, yeah. The dean and I made an agreement not to encourage that with them right now. With the freshmen. But with the yeah. upperclassmen, if it's working, okay. Yeah. And it depends. Um, but uh, it, it, it just depends on the students involved, the course. And when I've gone back and I've looked at those who, well, management science is, uh, well, 4403 data handling is the highest, it's 4,000 level. And that's the one where I had the most virtual participation. And I've looked back at them and analyzed some of their data and I can go in, I can see things like page views, how long they were in the in submission of uh, submission of assignments, et cetera. Yeah. And their attendance is their engagement is as good or better than the students who are in the seats. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I, I know with this with the upper class upper division classes who's you know, who's there, who's not out there now because like I'll show you here real quickly. I don't know if you've used it or not, but this will show me the participants. Now there were some others here they've all dropped off, but these are people who I know yeah. are here. Yeah. It's just, a, it's, it's, you know, I know you've used stuff like this before, so it's not a big revelation, but I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to experiment a little bit and the Dean was pretty nervous about me doing it. I've worked online for a long time, a lot of different venues. Mm -hmm. And so I said, let's try this approach and see if it is helpful for us with our athletes. Yeah. So I don't engage in the debate with a student who's an athlete, I was gone and this, yeah. and I mean, yeah. it's all there. They can work at their own pace if they desire to. Right. Right. And uh, I don't know, I, I know there are many, many people here, many of my colleagues who, would not be at all comfortable with what I'm doing. And I understand right. that. Right. Yeah. I think it depends on the discipline as well. So. It does. It depends a lot on that. I don't I don't know how you would do this teaching civ or yeah, English or art. Or art or or, or what. Yeah, it would be tough. Yeah. yeah. It would be yeah. tough to do. But these quantitative types of courses lend themselves to it. And um, now I know the grad school, all of the classes in grad school are online. I'm not sure how they handle all of that. I'm really not. Yeah. I, I, I got out of it. I don't. I'm. I can, I'm graduate faculty status, but I quit teaching in graduate school because I felt like they were trying to move everybody to a cookie cutter. Okay. Okay. And I've taught online for a lot of different places before I came here, and so I've used all the platforms. Blackboard is the best. There's no doubt about that. And I worked in environments where it was a cookie cutter. So you're really a, nothing more than a glorified hand holder and grader. And in other environments where you really were a professor and you designed yeah. the course and did all and like we like we do here. Yeah. Uh, there's some to be said for it. Um, and I'm I I've tried what I've what I decided was we were having 
I just really didn't want to have the drama of I've got to be in wherever and so I can't make it to class. So I tell students, if, if you're at a, uh, athletes, if you're traveling and I am and you're in a hotel, you probably have a hotel, probably have internet access or you should work ahead of time. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, okay. it's well, thanks, Keith. Oh, you know, I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much. Um, yeah, I've, and I guess once once he's through, I mean, you're you're chairing the committee, aren't you? I don't think so. Oh, oh Randy's chairing it. That's right. Yeah, I suckered him into that. Yeah, yeah. we'll find a date to meet. Yeah, and go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good you too. Thank you.